Hey guys, Marvelous Joe at the top of the episode to let you know that as a special surprise for you, our listeners, for this milestone 300th episode of this podcast, we have created a special Marvel vs. DC deck building card game called Infinity Crisis. This game is something that Jonathan and I have been working on for almost 10 years now, and it is now available as an exclusive gift to our patrons who make a one-time donation of $50. Details can be found when you join us at patreon.com slash dynamic duel. The story of the card game is this. Within the Marvel and DC comic universes exist items of such immense power and energy, they have ruptured the fabric of reality and the barrier that separates their worlds. As the universes collide, heroes from each world must join the race to collect their powerful items first and restore their reality, lest their world be the one lost to infinity. That sounds cool. As with any deck building card game, you use resources to gain greater resources. And in our game, you use S.H.I.E.L.D. and Argus agents to recruit heroes to defeat villains like the Joker and Thanos to earn special artifacts from the Marvel and DC universes, such as the Infinity Gems and the Mother Box. There are 165 cards total in the game. It's huge and it's a lot of fun. We can't wait for you all to play it. You could do so again by becoming patrons of this show at patreon.com slash dynamic duel. On with the show, episode 300. Hi, welcome to the Dynamic Duel Podcast, a weekly show where we review superhero films and debate the superiority between Marvel and DC by comparing their characters in stat-based battle simulations. I'm Johnny DC. And I'm his twin brother, Marvelous Joe. And welcome to episode 300. Holy shit. Hey guys, 300 episodes. You know how long this show has been around? Way too fucking long. (laughs) It's almost (laughs) like one episode a day for a whole year. We just need 65 more episodes and we're there. That's that's crazy. You know, we've been doing this show since January of 2016. You and I started doing this the day we turned 30 years old. And now we're 36, you know, in the back half of our 36th year. It's been a wild ride. You know, milestones like this make you kind of pause for reflection. And because the show has become such a routine part of my life, it's hard to say that this episode feels any different than any episode we do on a given week. But I do want to say, you know, 300 episodes in, I'm proud of the show that we've created here. You know, we really didn't quite hit our stride until episode 100. uh, So it took us a while to get good, you know, but um, I love the show. I love making the show and love getting to chat with you every week about our favorite subject since we were kids. Here's to 300 more. Oh, God. (laughs) Jeez, I don't know. I don't know about that. We'll see. Well, in this monumental milestone episode, as usual, per every anniversary episode, we will be doing a team duel, this time pitting Young Justice against the Young Avengers. Yeah, these are like the sidekicks and young teen heroes of the respective DC and Marvel universes. These are the up and comers who still have a lot to learn in terms of crime fighting, but learn a lot of great lessons and have a lot of great drama in their stories. Yeah, this is our seventh team duel now that we've done. And uh, I'm really looking forward to this one because this has some great legacy heroes as a part of the teams. And Young Justice is going down. So that's cool. You think? You think? How young and naive of you? (laughs) You'll find out. You'll find out later. Well, we'll get into the matchup later on. Before that, we're going to break down the comic book movie news from the past week, of which there was only Marvel news. It's a big Marvel episode, apparently. Hell yeah. Big news, we learned that Hugh Jackman is going to reprise his role as Wolverine, Logan, in Deadpool 3. And we also learned that Armor Wars, starring Don Cheadle, the Disney Plus series, is being reworked as a feature film. As always, we list our segment times in our episode description, so feel free to check out the show notes if you want to skip ahead to a particular topic. Don't forget, guys, to join us on Patreon, where we offer ad-free episodes of the show, bonus content including top 10 episodes and bloopers, our brand new Infinity Crisis Marvel vs. DC deck building card game, and access to our Discord chat server. Check it out right after this episode at patreon.com slash dynamic duel, linked in our show notes. Our lowest tier is only $2 a month. 
And for $10, you could become an executive producer of this show and help us determine our episode content. But with that out of the way, quick to the no prize. A no prize is an award Marvel used to give out up until the 90s to fans. Our version, the Dynamic Duel No Prize, is a digital award we post on Instagram for the person that we feel gave the best answer to our question of the week. Last week's question was, in a Black Adam sequel, would you rather see Black Adam go up against the Suicide Squad, the Justice League, or the Shazam family, and why? And this is coming off the rumor that the sequel to Black Adam will be a Black Adam versus one of the DCEU teams. Yeah, it's rumored that's what Dwayne Johnson, The Rock, wants the sequel to be. And no argument from us. That would be badass. And it was interesting to hear from you guys what you thought would be best. We got quite a number of answers, but we have three honorable mentions and a winner that we're going to go through now. Our first honorable mention goes to CJ Craft, who said... Hey guys, CJ Craft here. Just wanted to wish you a happy 300th episode and tell you you should be proud of your catalog so far. And I look forward to you only adding to it. Um, as for the question of the week, I think Black Adam should take on the Shazam family in one movie and narrowly win to set up for a sequel where he fights the Justice League. Um, I, I'd be pretty on board for both those movies. Again, happy 300th episode, guys, and I love what you do. Keep it up. Yeah, it seems only fitting that since we've already seen Shazam in live action and since Black Adam is a Shazam villain, that we would see those two characters go against each other in a Black Adam sequel. Yeah, if that never happened, it would almost be like Marvel setting up a Magneto movie and then having him never go up against the X-Men. You know, the Shazam family is meant to go up against Black Adam. Right. And we really need to see that happen, despite how cool it would be to see Black Adam go up against the Justice League. First, at least, it needs to be the Shazam family, especially since they've already been well established in their own films. I think it would be really cool to see. Yeah, exactly. Landon Parker actually also gave this answer. So congrats to him as well. Our next honorable mention, though, goes to Miggy Mathangian, who said, Hey guys, this is Miggy, and I would rather have Black Adam fight the Suicide Squad in the sequel. I think it works better thematically, um, like you could have Waller send the team against something she deems a threat to American interests, and a lot of the members could die while fighting him, which would be in character for both the Suicide Squad and Black Adam. Yeah, with Black Adam being the ruler of Kandak, you could get into some really interesting political stories. And the Suicide Squad, as a team of the U.S. government, a covert one, could easily play into a story about politics. Yeah, where they try to remove the ruler of Kandak in the interests of the United States government. Could totally see that being the setup for a Black Adam sequel. And Mickey had mentioned how a lot of the team members could die in the mission, which would totally happen if we're talking about, you know, the Suicide Squad going up against Black Adam. Black Adam is ruthless, and the Suicide Squad is not only weaker, they're also highly expendable. And I think that could be pretty fun to actually watch Black Adam just slaughter a whole bunch of these B-list villains. Yeah, it could be a villain versus villain movie, which is, you know, something we've never seen before. Yeah, that'd be cool. Brandon Estegard also gave the same exact answer of the Suicide Squad, but he also mentioned how the R rating of the Suicide Squad franchise would play in awesome to the characterization of Black Adam, where you could just have him, you know, like ripping dudes' spines out of dudes' assholes, you know, things Jeez. like that. <laughs> yeah, no, we definitely get to see Black Adam's full potential, which would be really cool. Our final honorable mention goes to Colby Henches, who said, Hey boys, it's Colby Henches. Who do I want to see fight Black Adam and Black Adam 2? The magic users. Send in Justice League Dark. John Constantine, Zatanna, Dead Man, all of them. But it's The Rock, and he wants to fight the biggest names he can get, so he wants the Justice League. Yeah, considering Black Adam's powers are magic-based, it's not a far reach to consider Justice League Dark as potential antagonists to his character. And, you know, I know we haven't seen Justice League Dark on screen yet, but considering the fact that they're introducing the JSA in this first film, I don't see any reason why they couldn't introduce another team in the sequel. Yeah, and in that regard, the Black Adam franchise could be a great world-building tool for the larger DCEU. Yeah, absolutely. We didn't even think about Justice League Dark as one of the options for this question of the week, but I'm really glad that Colby Henches thought of it, as did fellow listener Carson. So congrats to both of you. We also want to give a quick shout out to Benjamin Ryan, Michael Harold, Corey Wooten, and Scotty Macho for also calling in to leave their question of the week answers. We really appreciate you guys doing that. But the winner of this week's no prize is Jacob Bell, who said, Hey, what's up, guys? This is Jacob Bell. I don't know if this answer is technically allowed, but I'm going to say that Black Adam should fight the Justice League and 
Shazam should be a part of the Justice League. And Black Adam defeats almost all the members of the Justice League except for Superman and Shazam. And then we can finally have the Superman and Shazam against Black Adam fight, just like the animated short. So, yeah, that's my answer. Justice League with Shazam a part of the Justice League. And this is a perfect answer. It's the perfect answer. It's the one that I was hoping someone would say because it was what I was thinking of when we asked the question. Have Shazam be part of the Justice League since he has been part of that team in the comics and then have them all go up against Black Adam. Yeah, everyone wants to see Henry Cavill and Gal Gadot and Ben Affleck and everyone return in the Justice League. We want to see them on screen again. But tossing Zachary Levi as Shazam into that team is just brilliant, especially considering the fact that Gal Gadot is supposed to cameo in Shazam 2, and we already have a Superman cameo in the first Shazam film. So they've established that Shazam has spoken with these other Justice League characters, so why not have him be a part of the team to go up against the Shazam villain Black Adam? It makes sense. It makes sense. Perfect sense. I don't think you necessarily need the entire Shazam family because really what people want to see is Henry Cavill as Superman fighting Black Adam alongside Zachary Levi as Shazam. Give the people what they want. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that battle was great in the Superman Shazam, The Return of Black Adam DC animated short, which Jacob Bell did mention. If you guys haven't checked that out, definitely check it out and then you'll be full gung-ho for this answer. Great answer. So congrats again to Jacob Bell for winning this week's No Prize. If you, the listener, want a shot at winning your own No Prize, stay tuned to later on this episode when we'll be asking another question of the week. And now that that's done, on to the news. All right, guys, it was probably the biggest news to have come out in years. Definitely the biggest news to come out this year. We learned this past week that Ryan Reynolds is bringing along Hugh Jackman for Deadpool 3. And we got a release date for that. It's coming out September 6th, 2024. This is massive. It's incredible. I squealed with joy like a toddler at Christmas. I'm just so happy. I think all of us fans are just really excited about this news. I would say I did not have that reaction at all. I probably had like the opposite of that reaction. Oh, Um, because you're a hater DC fan? Well, well, that, but also (laughs) um, I felt like it kind of tarnished the perfect goodbye we had with the movie Logan. Well, Hugh Jackman and Ryan Reynolds did address that in a follow up to their announcement the day prior with a video that explained this movie does not change the events of the movie Logan. You know, of course, that movie took place fictionally in the year 2029. So it's likely that Deadpool's interaction with Wolverine in Deadpool 3 is going to be a prequel to the events of that 2029 setting. And that doesn't surprise me. You know, Deadpool got a time machine at the end of Deadpool 2. So yeah, he could definitely pull Wolverine out of whatever year he wants to pull him out of. Well, it may not even involve him pulling him out of the timeline. It could just literally be a movie set in the present day before the year 2029. I think it's a prequel. Uh, Of course, they could go any number of routes with this. It could also be a multiversal variant of Logan or something like that. A version of the character that Deadpool stumbles upon using his time traveling device that he got from Cable. You're right. It could be any number of possibilities, though. I'd like to think that like Deadpool is just like going back through the timeline watching Wolverine like he's watching a movie or something like that. And then like Wolverine accidentally like busts his time machine device and they get stranded in some other multiverse like the MCU. It is interesting that Cable's time traveling device is kind of like the perfect MacGuffin to bring these characters into the MCU. It is perfect. You almost wonder if like they did that intentionally to set up this story for Deadpool 3. It's hard to say because Deadpool 2 came out right around the same time as the Disney Fox merger. I mean, that's why they came out with the Once Upon a Deadpool PG-13 variant of the movie, because I believe Disney wanted to see how successful a PG-13 version of the film could be. Now, of course, in subsequent interviews, Kevin Feige had said that Marvel Studios plans on keeping Deadpool as the R-rated franchise that it is. And they've kind of like proved that by releasing R-rated films like Logan, Deadpool and Deadpool 2 on the Disney Plus platform. Yeah, Disney is definitely stretching the idea of Disney, which is typically family friendly. Still, though, like I was all ready to hear about casting for a new Wolverine. And the fact that Hugh Jackman is coming back to a role he said he was done with. I I still feel uneasy about. Maybe you just need to, you know, lighten up more and be like happy in life. You know, 
<laughs> Learn how to find the joy in things. You know, you don't have to be all freaking negative Nancy about this news because it's awesome. Just because Jackman appears in this film doesn't necessarily mean that he's going to be the MCU's version of Wolverine. It could be merely that version of Wolverine coming into the MCU and maybe even paving the way for a new Wolverine to take on the mantle. If that torch is indeed passed in this film, I think there's no one better to pass it than the guy who first played the character himself. Oh, you're saying this film could introduce a new Wolverine as well? You never know. You never know. You know, they're just starting to introduce mutants into the MCU. We saw that with Ms. Marvel, and we're going to see it again continue with the upcoming Wakanda Forever movie, where Marvel has stated that Namor the Submariner is indeed a mutant. Which is great. I did read about that. I love that. I do have to say that whether I like this news or not, Ryan Reynolds is a marketing genius. He really is. I really love the way he sold this news where he is like, you know, we got to make sure that Deadpool 3 is something special, you know, and he's pouring a whole handle of aviation gin into his mug and stuff like that. And he's sitting at the typewriter hitting one key at a time. And he's like, I got nothing. <laughs> he's like, but I did have one idea as Hugh Jackman walks by in the background and he's like, hey, Hugh, you want to play Wolverine again? He's like, yeah, sure, Ryan. I thought that was great. So good because it plays upon the infamous joke rivalry that the two actors have. Of course, you know, they're best of friends. And I think, you know, the potential of this movie is incredible because both Hugh Jackman and Ryan Reynolds were like born to play their respective roles. It's going to be so much fun to see them in action again outside of their roles in the X-Men Origins Wolverine film, because we all know that sucked. I did appreciate the clarification about the timeline. And I also love how they acted like they were spoiling the movie through like pantomime with like the, the music overlay. That was great. Yeah. I'm so excited by this news. Really, September 6, 2024 can't come soon enough. So technically, this movie will be part of Marvel's Phase 5. I guess it'll be the last film of Phase 5, sandwiched in between the Thunderbolts and Fantastic Four, if I remember that correctly. Fantastic Four, of course, kicking off Phase 6. So much to look forward to as a Marvel fan. In other Phase 5 news, or potentially Phase 6, depending on when this movie comes out, we also learned this past week that the Armor Wars television show is no longer a television show and is now being produced as a feature film, still starring Don Cheadle as War Machine. Of course, the Armor Wars story in the comics involved Justin Hammer getting a hold of Iron Man's tech and applying it to all of Iron Man's villains. So he had to go up against a bunch of other armored bad guys. It was a great story from the comics. I have a feeling it's going to be a great movie, especially if the studio is putting this much faith into it as a feature film instead of a show. Honestly, I'm kind of torn on this news, too. I know you're excited for all of this news, but, you know, I look at it from a less biased perspective, I guess. Um, <laughs> no, I wrong. doubt that. I doubt that. There's nothing wrong with the television show's long form content. You can still tell a great story. Look at something like Daredevil season three. Mm -hmm. This show was only supposed to be six episodes, so it's not like it was going to be padded with unnecessary storylines or anything like that. To me, making it a movie just means that you're removing story that should have been there. Or you're moving story that didn't need to be there. I have a feeling that if they're making it a movie, what they found during the script writing process was that they probably have story that plays better in a two hour runtime. So instead of being a negative Nancy like you are still being, <laughs> I choose to be excited by this. I'm really glad that I'm going to get to see it in theaters. And I think it's going to be a great vehicle for Don Cheadle to headline his own Marvel film, considering he's been part of the MCU since Iron Man 2, almost since the very beginning. Well, I mean, this probably does mean that the project will get an increased budget because I think films usually do have larger budgets than TV shows, I think. Yeah, because it's easier to track the return on investment from a feature film that gets a theatrical release. We know that Don Cheadle is going to appear next in the upcoming Secret Invasion television series. You know, truth be told, I think that would have been cool as a movie, too, because it looks so cinematic from the trailer. But um, however we get these stories, whether it be series or movie, I'm just glad that they're being made and that we get to see them. We don't know when we're going to get to see Armor Wars hit theaters. Again, I don't know if it's phase five or six, but uh, we'll let you guys know when they announce that release date. But uh, not really dealing with any of the news items from the past week. We now present you with our question of the week. In honor of this 300th episode, we want to ask you, what has been your favorite team duel episode of Dynamic Duel and why? Again, there's been seven of them. There was Justice League vs. Avengers. Titans vs. X-Men. Justice Society of America vs. The Fantastic Four. Uh, Suicide Squad vs. Defenders. Justice League Dark vs. Midnight Suns. Arkham Asylum vs. Sinister Six. And lastly, this episode, 
Young Justice versus Young Avengers. We'd really like to hear your guys' thoughts, so record your answer at dynamicduel.com by clicking on the red microphone button in the bottom right-hand corner, which will prompt you to leave us a voicemail. Your message could be up to 30 seconds long, and don't forget to leave your name in case we include you on the podcast. We'll pick our favorite answer and award that person a Dynamic Duel No Prize that we'll post to Instagram. Be sure to answer before October 8th. But that does it for the news portion of this episode. Now let's move on to the main event of episode 300, where we find out who would win in an all-out battle between the teams Young Justice and Young Avengers. Okay, Young Justice versus Young Avengers... This episode was chosen specifically by our executive producers to be our latest team match. Yeah, these young characters were really popular with our ex-pros, which is what we like to call our executive producers. Yeah, I'm pretty excited about this matchup. As I mentioned earlier, Young Justice and Young Avengers are both teams of young heroes, and they're really legacy characters. Legacy is a huge thing in DC, and it's becoming a pretty huge thing in Marvel, so much so that a lot of Young Avengers are starting to make appearances in the MCU on screen, and one of DC's most popular animated series of all time is Young Justice. So I'm not surprised that these teams were selected to be pit against each other. Yeah, I'm also pretty excited. The Young Avengers characters are some of Marvel's most exciting new heroes to appear on the scene within the Marvel Comics universe. I was right in my heyday of collecting comics when the Young Avengers came out, and I I thought it was really cool. I remember being really hyped for the team when they first hit the scene, and it'll be cool to see who wins between them and Young Justice. I was a big collector of Young Justice when that series first started. Uh, It was written by Peter David. It was hilarious. It was just a really fun read. The first arc of Young Avengers was written by Alan Heinberg, who, of course, went on to write the Wonder Woman film later on. And the Sandman Netflix series. Yeah. As you guys know, for every team duel match that we have, we pit seven characters from a team against seven characters. And the reason we go with seven is because that's what our model allows for. We're basically pairing matrices of data against each other as opposed to sets of data. So it takes a while and we need to set specific parameters. So seven versus seven is what we usually go with. Well, let's get into it. If you've never listened to one of our dual episodes before, the way we determine a winner between these two teams is by running 1000 Monte Carlo simulations using each individual character statistics. A Monte Carlo simulation is a probabilistic model used to determine outcomes through random sampling. And in our case, it randomizes statistics along a normal distribution, which is a bell curve, as a way to simulate the many variables that can occur during battle. The stat parameters we use are based on the official Marvel Power Grid, and we use that criteria to extrapolate the DC team stats. We've included some additional stat categories of our own, such as range, damage potential, versatility, and perception, in order to create a more complete and robust simulation. Now, normally we run 1,000 simulations. For team duels, we run 49,000. But that gives us a percentage of wins for each team. And we declare the team with the higher percentage to be the ultimate victor, considering that that team's more likely to win any given battle. No team ever wins 100% of the time. Comics have shown that there's usually a way for the Suicide Squad to beat the Justice League, and we feel our method falls in line with the precedents that have been established in the comic book stories. And we use this method, of course, because it was the least subjective, most unbiased way to determine who would win. Of course, Jonathan and I are both heavily biased toward our respective allegiances, so instead of debating these matches forever, we just let the math decide for us. There are no fan votes here and no relying on just feats. Before we run the simulations, though, we like to break down each team's histories and rosters before improvising a scenario on how we imagine one of the simulations we run would play out beat for beat. And I believe it's my turn to go first with the DC side of things. So let me tell you about the history of Young Justice. The teenage superheroes Superboy, Impulse, and the Robin Tim Drake first met when they independently responded to news of an evacuation due to the release of a toxic entity. At the request of the Department of Extra Normal Operations, or the DEO, the three heroes managed to capture the entity, who turned out to be a young girl in a non-toxic, gaseous form. To protect her from the DEO, they agreed to say that she died in an explosion. 
when the childhood villain known as Bedlam magically transferred all adults to an alternate dimension, Superboy, Impulse, and Robin tracked him to the Justice League's old cave headquarters in Happy Harbor. You can learn more about the Justice League in our Justice League vs. Avengers Team Duel episode. After defeating Bedlam and returning the adults to Earth, the three boys decided to form a team after realizing that they worked well together. During their first team meeting slash sleepover at the Happy Harbor Cave, they accidentally awoke the dormant android superhero, Red Tornado, who you can learn more about in our Red Tornado vs. Sandman duel episode. After Red Tornado decided to chaperone and mentor the young team, which was dubbed Young Justice, it wasn't long before more young heroes joined their ranks, namely Wonder Girl, Arrowette, and Secret, the latter of whom was the young girl that was rescued from the DEO. They were also joined by a quasi-sentient flying, teleporting, and matter-phasing vehicle from New Genesis they dubbed the Super Cycle, which transported the team to their adventures. Now, Secret was an amnesia Amnesiac ethereal warding spirit, essentially a ghost, who was murdered by her adoptive brother Billy as a sacrifice to the demon Buzz, who promised Billy the power to become the world's most lethal supervillain. As the villain Harm, Billy easily defeated Young Justice, and even reprogrammed Red Tornado while placing a bomb in his chest before attempting to kill the Pope. Young Justice managed to save their mentor and the Pontiff, but not before Harm escaped. Harm was killed that same night at home by his adopted father in fear of what else his adopted son could do. During their adventures, Young Justice had to constantly deal with DEO agents Donald Fight and Ishido Mad, who wanted to reclaim Secret. The team ran into further trouble with the government when they helped Red Tornado kidnap his daughter when he was denied custody due to being an android, and when Arrowette nearly killed a man in retaliation for the death of her therapist. With the media and Congress turned against young heroes due to their antics, Arrowette retired from the team and her superhero career. Not long after, Young Justice was joined by a mysterious young and lethal heroine named Empress, who was later revealed to be Anita Fight, the daughter of Agent Fight. Wanted by the government and forced to flee their Happy Harbor headquarters, Young Justice and fellow young super team the Titans, who you can learn more about in our Titans vs. X-Men team duel, were confronted by the Justice League just as Clarion the Witch Boy swapped the ages of superheroes and their sidekicks, turning the Young Justice team into adults. Displaying true maturity and heroism in their adult forms, Young Justice managed to reverse public opinion regarding young superheroes after defeating Clarion. Forming a new headquarters in an abandoned hotel in the Catskill Mountains, the entire team took a temporary leave of absence and was replaced for a time by Beast Boy, the Batgirl Cassandra Kane, and the still de-aged Lobo, as well as Flamebird, Captain Marvel Jr., and Lagoon Boy. During an off-world mission to protect the planet Merg from invading forces, the original team encountered Little Lobo once again, and he joined their ranks just before the Our Worlds at War event, where Earth allied with the planet Apocalypse to defeat Brainiac 13. In the aftermath of the event, Young Justice was left stranded on Apocalypse, where they were captured and tortured by Granny Goodness and her female Furies, save for Secret, in whom Darkseid took a particular interest as he saw her powerful potential. You can learn more about Darkseid in our Darkseid vs. Thanos episode. With the help of Little Lobo's ability to regenerate from even a single drop of blood, a war amongst an army of Little Lobo clones created enough chaos on the planet for the Young Justice team to eventually escape. Traumatized by the ordeal, Impulse decided to retire and quit the team, along with Robin, due to the ongoing mistrust amongst his teammates that he had contingency plans to defeat each member, just as Batman had for the Justice League. Red Tornado was joined by former Justice League sidekick Snapper Carr in mentoring the team, and Snapper recruited the Ray to the team while also getting the Spectre, who you can learn more about in our Spectre vs Galactus episode, to mentor Secret personally and through his help, Secret learned of her past identity and her nature of being a warding spirit. When the young villain Bedlam resurfaced, Robin and Impulse came out of retirement to rejoin the team, now led by Wonder Girl. 
when Empress's father, Agent Fight, was kidnapped and murdered by her supervillain grandfather, Agua Singaz, Young Justice recruited many other young heroes, including Jakeem Thunder and Kid Devil, to storm the nation of Zandia to capture Singaz and bring him to justice. Though he was ultimately defeated by Arrowette's mother, Bonnie King Jones, the former Miss Arrowette. And in the aftermath, Empress was left with two infant clones of her deceased parents. When Secret learned that her father was going to be executed for the murder of her adoptive brother, Harm, she asked the team for help rescuing him, though they refused. Seeker possessed her father to help him escape prison, and when the team confronted her, she attacked them in a violent rage before leaving Earth for Apocalypse to serve Darkseid. Young Justice followed her, and after being nearly defeated, Robin managed to appeal to Secret's inner goodness, which angered Darkseid and caused him to kill Little Lobo after using his Omega effect to return Secret to life and strip her of her powers, which she had actually yearned for all along. When a version of Brainiac caused the deaths and hospitalizations of several members of the Titans during a team-up with Young Justice, both teams decided to disband, though members from both would later form a new incarnation of the Teen Titans. After the Flashpoint event rebooted DC's continuity and Dr. Manhattan restored pre-Flashpoint existence, Robin, Impulse, and Wonder Girl joined forces with Teen Lantern, Ginny Hex, and the young princess of Gemworld, Amethyst, to stop an invasion of Metropolis by Gemworld's evil lord, Dark Opal. After traveling to Gemworld and finding Superboy there, the new Young Justice overthrew Dark Opal, though for throwing Gemworld into chaos, the team was banished into the multiverse. After returning home, the multiverse-traversing young hero Naomi joined the team before the evil head of Star Labs, Dr. Glory, sent Superboy to the dimension of Scarterus. Dr. Glory was from another world in the multiverse, and after moving up the ranks to control Star Labs and perform illegal experiments, Superboy had attempted to stop her in the past, which is why he was initially sent to Gemworld. Recruiting young heroes around the world, including Arrowette, Aqualad, the Wonder Twins, and more, Young Justice was able to rescue Superboy and stop Star Labs. As newly deputized junior members of the Justice League, Young Justice helped the League fight the Legion of Doom and Leviathan. Recently, when members of the Justice League seemingly died in a dark crisis, the original three members of Young Justice, Superboy, Impulse, and Robin, were transported back in time to the early days of Young Justice, and that Dark Crisis story is still ongoing. Now, since Superboy, Impulse, and Robin were the founding members of Young Justice, it made sense to include all three on the team I'll be using for this team duel. And since Wonder Girl and Arrowette joined early on, they'll also be joining the ranks this episode. Secret is the only remaining member of the original team that I won't be using, in part because she lost her power, but also because she hasn't been a member of the team in over a decade. Instead, I'm replacing her with Aqualad, who doesn't have an expansive history on the Young Justice team in the comics, he really only joined for one adventure, but he is a popular and founding member of the team in the Young Justice animated series, which our executive producers are huge fans of. Also for that reason, we're including Miss Martian for this team as its seventh member. In the comics, she's been a member of the Teen Titans, the Titans, and the Justice League, but never a member of Young Justice. She was a prominent member in the cartoon, however, so we're making an exception. Yeah, sometimes the most popular iteration of a team is not necessarily from the comics, but from another medium. Right, exactly. But uh, that's my team. Superboy, Impulse, Robin, Wonder Girl, Arrowette, Aqualad, and Miss Martian. Yeah, that sounds pretty good. You know, it feels like Young Justice to me, like an amalgamation of the comics universe and the television show universe. Right, right. And plus, there are a lot of characters on that team that have parallels to the characters on my Young Avengers team, the history of which I'm going to break down now. Once, a team of Earth's mightiest heroes, known as the Avengers, were torn apart and disbanded. The hero known as Scarlet Witch had long been emotionally manipulated by the villain Doctor Doom, and as a result of the grief over her lost children, she suffered a mental breakdown and lashed out at her teammates. As a result of her reality-warping powers, the Avengers suffered heavy losses, including the destruction of the android that was once the Scarlet Witch's husband, named Vision. With the Avengers Mansion base destroyed and their members dead, injured, missing, or recovering, 
the Avengers were no more. They were disassembled. You can learn more about this in our Justice League vs. Avengers Duel episode. Meanwhile, a young teen named Nathaniel Richards came to the present from the future of the 30th century, seeking the Avengers. He wanted their help to protect him from his own future self, as he would one day become the time-traveling villain known as King the Conqueror, whom you can learn more about in our Professor Zoom vs. King the Conqueror duel episode. Finding the Avengers base in ruins at the time, Nathaniel found the remains of Vision and downloaded the android's memories into his futuristic armor. Within Vision's systems, he found the Avengers Failsafe program, which was a database of potential Avengers recruits should the original team ever be destroyed or disbanded. Each name in the Failsafe program had some tie to a former member of the team, and using it, Nathaniel located new, unofficial Avengers members. He first recruited Eli Bradley, the grandson of Isaiah Bradley, the first black American to have successfully received the Super Soldier Serum after Captain America. Eli took on the name Patriot. Nathaniel's next recruit was Billy Kaplan, a mutant with innate magical abilities who was the reincarnated soul of one of the Scarlet Witch's lost children. Billy initially modeled himself after Thor and went by the name Asgardian, but he later changed his codename to Wiccan. Lastly, Nathaniel recruited Teddy Altman, the unknowing son of the alien Kree hero Marvell and the shapeshifting Skrull princess Anel. Taking on the appearance similar to the Hulk, Teddy became known as Hulkling. Nathaniel himself reshaped his futuristic armor to resemble Iron Man and chose to go by Iron Lad. Together, the four teen boys prepared themselves as heroes to be ready for the forthcoming King the Conqueror. When the untrained group found themselves in trouble while attempting to save the day in a hostage situation, one of the hostages, a teenager named Kate Bishop, helped cause a distraction to let the boys take down the bad guys. Soon after, Cassie Lang, the teenage daughter of the hero Ant-Man, sought out Kate Bishop and together the pair tracked down the boys at the ruins of the Avengers Mansion. The girls demanded to be part of their group, which at that point the press had already dubbed the Young Avengers. Kate Bishop grabbed Hawkeye's old bow and became the new Hawkeye. Cassie had already been experimenting with her father's pimp particles and became the size-changing hero named Stature. Together, they were the original Young Avengers. Their efforts were soon shut down by Captain America, Iron Man, and Jessica Jones, right as King the Conqueror arrived, who convinced the heroes that Nathaniel, aka Iron Lad, must return to his native future timeline and become King the Conqueror in order to prevent an apocalyptic future. Despite saying goodbye to the team's founder, and despite warnings from the adult heroes for them to stop fighting crime untrained, the Young Avengers continued on in secret in a new headquarters financed by Kate Bishop, whose family was wealthy. After a run-in with a Super Scroll, the team sought out more recruits and broke Tommy Shepard out of a detention facility. Tommy, who was the reincarnated soul of the Scarlet Witch and Vision's other son, was a mutant nicknamed Speed for his high-velocity powers. He joined the Young Avengers to fight against the Super Scroll, who shocked the team with revelations about Hulkling's Kree Scroll origins and Speed and Wiccan's former parentage. Later, the teens sided with Captain America's anti-registration side during the Superhuman Civil War, and they were the first team to respond to the Skrull attack on Manhattan during their secret invasion, though the team was defeated. During Norman Osborn's attempted siege of Asgard, the young heroes assisted the Avengers against Osborn's forces, joining the fight and running rescue and evacuation missions. After the Young Avengers helped rescue Scarlet Witch from Doctor Doom, who had usurped her powers in an attempt to channel the life force and resurrect the dead, Billy and Tommy were finally reunited with their mother, and the team was finally accepted as full-fledged Avengers. Despite this, the team disbanded due to the death of Cassie Lang, Stature, during the battle with Doom. The Young Avengers later reformed to fight an interdimensional parasite called Mother, and during that battle they were joined by the multiversal hero America Chavez, aka Miss America, and the extra-dimensional Kree teen warrior named Novar, aka Marvel Boy. They were also joined by Kid Loki, an adolescent reincarnation of the God of Mischief, who trained Billy, aka Wiccan, in the use of his power. Loki temporarily aged Billy up and unleashed his full potential as a powerful magic entity called the Demiurge. With this unlocked power, the team finally defeated the Parasite Mother, joined by new recruit David Elaine, aka Prodigy, and the team returned to their home dimension. Later, Teddy, aka Hulkling, was informed by the Kree and Skrull leaders that due to his parentage, he was the only one who could lead the new Kree-Skrull alliance against their common alien foe, the Kotati. 
After becoming the alleged king of space by pulling the ancient alien sword Excelsior from a distant planet, Teddy and Billy decided to head into space to rule the new Kree Skrull Empire. Before their departure from Earth, however, they were married in a ceremony attended by all the former Young Avengers members. And though that was the last time the team was together, they all went on to fulfill their own heroic goals. Speed and Prodigy traveled to the sentient island of Krakoa to assist in the formation of the new mutant nation. Hawkeye went on adventures with Clint Barton Hawkeye and formed a new iteration of the West Coast Avengers. Miss America went on to join the interdimensional superhero team The Ultimates and Marvel Boy became a representative of the Kree race in the new Galactic Council. The first recruit, Eli aka Patriot, hung up his shield for a while before traveling to Wakanda to fight alongside Black Panther. Chances are, they'll all one day meet again. Now, when it comes to the roster for the Young Avengers in this duel, I wanted to incorporate as many of the original team as I could while also representing some of the newer members. To that end, to fulfill the seven character slots for this team duel, I started with founding members Patriot, Hulkling, and Wiccan. Next to join were Hawkeye and Stature, though I decided not to use Stature since she later died as a member of the team and then never rejoined the Young Avengers when she was eventually resurrected by Doctor Doom out of guilt. I am including Kate Bishop Hawkeye though. Speed was the next early member, so he's in this duel as well, and rounding out this lineup are several of the newer team members, Miss America and Marvel Boy, both of whom are pretty powerful and definite wild cards due to their unique power sets. So again, that's Patriot, Wiccan, Hulkling, Hawkeye, Speed, Miss America, and Marvel Boy. If you want to learn more about any of these characters, check out their respective duel episodes where we go into their individual histories and abilities. Yeah, I think that's a solid team. I, the Young Avengers are a pretty cool team. I like them. Although I have to say, it was really hard to find art for this episode's cover because so much of the Young Avengers artwork out there is homoerotic fan art. <laughs> <laughs> oh, because like a lot of the members of the team are like queer. Yeah, I think that has something to do with it. <laughs> well, now that we get these teams' histories and rosters out of the way, let's speculate on how one of the simulated matches will go. Remember, the winner is determined by simulations, not our speculation, but it's fun to imagine how this fight could play out. Now, we don't set any rules for this match other than the teams don't know anything about each other going in, except that the other team is a threat that needs to be put down. And we say they start off about 50 meters apart in an environment that has no bearing on the match itself because we don't take stats for the environment. Plus, certain teams have advantages in some environments over others, and we want the teams to win on their own merit. So let's get into it. Young Justice and Young Avengers meet on the battlefield. Who goes first? I think since Impulse is like by far the fastest member of either team, it makes sense for him to go first, all right? Of course. So he's going to start by sending out speed scouts to each member of the Young Avengers, and the scouts just start pummeling them at hyper speed. So there's like what? There's like seven impulses in the arena. He's creating yes. speed duplicates? Yes. Well, all right. I planned for this. I know Impulse is hard to deal with, but suddenly all these impulses on the battlefield find themselves running in Marvel Boy's pocket battlefield, which uh, as listeners may know from our Wonder Girl versus Marvel Boy episode is this like pink cube that Marvel Boy has that can expand and cover an entire area with special physics that he controls. So like these seven impulses, like they start moving in like slow motion <laughs> and they get sucked back into the original impulse and Patriot just knocks the guy out with his shield. That freaking pocket battlefield thing. Yeah, I like it. It's cool. It sucks. It's stupid. <laughs> I hate it. Okay, so all the Young Avengers are in this pink cube with unknown physics, right? Yeah. Yep. So I'm going to say Arrowette. She's just going to shoot like a volley of trick arrows into this cube. And because of like the crazy gravity within it, like a bunch of random chaotic chain reactions start taking place that like knock some of the Young Avengers out of the cube. Like an explosive arrow will like blast Speed and Hawkeye out of there. And like a smoke arrow will put Miss America to sleep. And a sonic what? arrow with like its strange frequency is just going to cause Marvel Boy to like piss himself. <laughs> <laughs> but the piss is gonna like fly all over Wiccan. <laughs> Isn't there a frequency that makes you shit your pants or something? Yeah, it's like the brown note or something like that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so like the Young Avengers, there's like piss everywhere and they're like, abort, abort. So Marvel Boy takes down the pocket battlefield. So the team's like kind of spread out and haphazardly they rush toward the Young Justice team. The speed obviously is gonna get there first uh, and he's just gonna 
vaporize Aqualad's water supply pack by vibrating the water molecules. <laughs> and then he's going to run over to Robin and give him an atomic wedgie. Just yank that all up in the dude's crack. And then uh, he's going to tie Superboy's shoelaces together. And then he's going to zip over to Wonder Girl and just yank her hair really hard down to the ground. Okay, Aqualad's water supply is gone. And maybe Robin has a wedgie, though I'm not even convinced that he wears underwear underneath the suit. What? How do you know that? <laughs> How do you know? I feel like it's a reasonable assumption. I don't know. <laughs> maybe, maybe. But like both Superboy and Wonder Girl, they're just as fast as speed. So as he's tying Superboy's shoelaces together, Superboy, he's just going to send a tactile telekinetic pulse through the ground that's going to send speed just flying. Oh, it's going to pop him up into the air? Yeah, and meanwhile, Miss Martian, she's going to take over the mind of Wiccan and cause him to fire like this lightning bolt right at Hulkling. Freaking Miss Martian, man. Okay, so... Hulkling is going to block the lightning bolt with his sword, Excelsior. And, you know, he's probably going to be confused why Wiccan is attacking him, but he's probably going to realize that someone's controlling him to do that. So Hulkling is going to try to like contain Wiccan to prevent him from hurting someone else by wrapping him up in like a giant fist that he creates using his shape-shifting powers. Okay. And that'll protect the team. Meanwhile, Hawkeye, she's going to wake up Miss America from the sleeping gas that got her using some smelling salts or something like that. I feel like Kate Bishop would have that. And once Miss America is awake, she's going to leap to her feet real quick and she's just going to stomp an interdimensional star portal right into the ground underneath Superboy. And it's going to shatter, causing him to fall through. Dude, Superboy doesn't fall. He flies. But he doesn't know that he was supposed to fly in the moment. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> right, he might dip down a little, but then he's right back in the air, and he's going to fly right at Miss America, and the two of them are probably going to start exchanging blows. All right. So as that's going on, Robin, who, you know, by this point, he's cut his underwear off with like a batarang or something <laughs> like that. He's going to hurl said batarang, which is an explosive batarang, into Hulkling's giant hand, hurting both him and Wiccan. Oh, Well, I mean, like, Hulkling is pretty durable, so Wiccan probably isn't that hurt by the explosive battering. But, yeah, we'll say Hulkling drops Wiccan out of his grasp, and then uh, Wiccan is going to teleport behind the Young Justice team. And he knows that Miss Martian is a telepath, since he knows that she briefly took him over to attack Hulkling. So Wiccan, he can kind of do some psychic stuff on his own. He's going to magically thought cast into her mind that she's like in this void of darkness and she can't perceive anything around her using her senses. Is he that powerful of a telepath? Because like she's really strong. Well, it's like magic telepathy. It's a different sort of psychic power. Okay. All right, so Aqualad, he's going to see Miss Martian acting weird and then he notices Wiccan standing behind them. So he's going to charge Wiccan. And as he gets near, uh, he doesn't have any water anymore, but he's going to sense Marvel Boy's piss that was all over Wiccan, <laughs> and he's going to channel the water from that <laughs> off of Wiccan using his water bearer handles, and he's going to form water swords, which he just starts a- what? using to attack Wiccan. There would have to be a whole lot of piss it on was. Wiccan to form it two w- whole swords out of. <laughs> Aqualad probably just was able to create two little tiny water daggers, if anything. <laughs> but, you know, like, Wiccan is just as much of an elemental controller as Aqualad. So, as Aqualad's Swinging these little knives at him, Wiccan's gonna just boil the water, causing it to evaporate, and Aqualad's not gonna have water anymore again. Ugh. So uh, he's just standing there, and Wiccan's gonna telekinetically hurl him across the battlefield. Meanwhile, Hawkeye fires an arrow at Arrowette that, like, is so accurate it severs the bow line on Arrowette's bow. Okay. Badass. What is this? Just like our Justice League versus Avengers matchup? Yeah, it's revenge time. <laughs> Mar- Marvel copying DC. I'm going to say that before Hawkeye's arrow reaches Arrowette, though, Robin, he's going to snatch that arrow out of the air. What? He's done it before. All right. And Arrowette is going to retaliate by firing a tear gas arrow at Hawkeye's feet, which is going to cause her to like choke and go temporarily blind. Oh, from the tear gas? Yeah. So meanwhile, Miss Martian, you know, she's probably still in that psychic void, I imagine. So she's going to 
reach out mentally to her allies and use their experiences to reorient herself in the battle and break out of that thought cast. Okay. She's going to see Speed gearing up to like run around the battlefield again. And so she's going to cast illusions into his mind that make him see duplicates of his enemies everywhere. So he's running around the battlefield attacking nothing, you know, and she's just going to go invisible and intangible. So no one else can attack her. What a cheater. What? How cheap. <laughs> what? She's going to cast all these illusions and then just go invisible and tangible like she's not there? Well, she's focusing on speed. Okay. Well, meanwhile, Marvel Boy uh, is going to shape his gauntlets into plasma blasters, and he's going to super speed blitz Robin, and it's going to be like, try catching this. And he's going to shoot the kid right in the chest, sending him flying way back. And then Marvel Boy is going to zip over to Wonder Girl and he's going to transform his gauntlets into blades and he's just going to slash at her. I mean, again, Wonder Girl, she's fast too. So she's going to block that slash of his with her gauntlets, her silver gauntlets. And then she'll conjure up her diamond blade, which is Zeus's sword. And she and Marvel Boy, you know, they're probably going to have a sword fight. So while they're doing that... Uh, Superboy, you know, he's still fighting Miss America, right? So Miss America, she's probably creating star portals left and right. So as she's flying at him, he's just going to use his super breath to blow her right into one of the portals, sending her into another dimension and out of the battlefield. I mean, she'll probably create a star portal. I don't know if she's creating star portals left and right. But yeah, she's probably talking shit. She's probably like, blow me. And he's like, okay. And then, you know, she gets blown into another dimension. (laughs) She'll be back. But uh, right after Superboy does this, he gets yanked out of the air and slammed into the ground over and over again like a rag doll by Hulkling. Kind of like how the Hulk did to Loki in the Avengers movie. Mm -hmm. And uh, Hulkling's going to be like, puny pretty boy. (laughs) What? And then he's going to chuck Superboy right into Arrowette. And Arrowette's going to fall down. And as she gets back up, all of a sudden, she sees this flying star sever her bowline, which was thrown <laughs> by Patriot. No. Yeah. He's that good with his five-pointed stars. I'm going to protect this bowline. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to say just before the bowline was severed, Impulse woke up from being knocked out, and he saw what Patriot did. So he's going to run back in time just a few seconds oh before the bowline was severed, and he's going to move that throwing star out of the way before... It could reach the bowline. And then he's going to run over to Hawkeye. And as her vision is coming back, he's just going to yank all of the arrows out of her quiver and deliver them to Arrowette, who's going to grab a random arrow, which happens to be a pin particle arrow. Oh, and of she's course. going to fire it right at Wiccan, causing him to like shrink down to the size of an ant. Wiccan? Yes. Okay. All right. So Impulse, he's, you know, zipping around the battlefield back in action, but all of a sudden, He's going to look down and see that he's standing right on top of this bright star-shaped spot on the ground. And he's going to be like, huh? And all of a sudden, it shatters as Miss America flies through it back into the battlefield. And uh, Impulse is going to fall right down into the portal into this acid dimension where, like, everything's fucking made out of acid. And he's going to just dissolve into a skeleton. Wait, why wasn't Miss America dissolved by the acid? She can fly. She didn't touch any of the uh, acid stuff. Impulse can't fly. So Impulse is dead. Wait, he's the first one to go? Do you see him getting out of that? Not really. (laughs) Then yes, he's the first one to go. Fuck. And then uh, Hawkeye, she's going to pull out her battle staves and uh, run over to Arrowette and just lay the beat down on her to get her arrows back that Impulse stole. Well, I'm pretty sure Arrowette would put up a good fight. She's trained in martial arts just like Hawkeye is. So she's blocking every attack with her bow. And while they're fighting, Aqualad... He's going to confront Patriot and straight up just like telekinetically pull all of the water out of him, like completely dehydrating him. So he's basically dead. And with that water, Aqualad, he's going to like form a wave, which he's going to surf on toward Hulkling. And he's going to use that wave to like ramp up into the air and then use that water to form a giant like barbed water spear that he's just going to drive down into Hulkling. Whoa simultaneously charging him full of electricity. Jeez. Boom. That was a badass move. Hell yeah. shit. So Hulkling is stabbed through and electrocuted. The impalement wouldn't really hurt Hulkling because he can shift his organs out of the way. So he's not like fatally hurt, 
But to avoid the electrocution, he's going to uh, activate his negaband ring, his wedding ring that both he and Wick can have that lets them transpose themselves in time and space. Uh huh. So suddenly Wiccan is standing where Hulkling was, but he's only, you know, like the size of an ant. You know, he's tiny, so he's not impaled or anything. He's just standing next to the water spear. And, you know, electricity doesn't hurt Wiccan anyway. So Wiccan, while shrunken down, he's just going to do the same thing again where he evaporates all of Aqualad's water again. So damn it! Aqualad, once again, no more water. He's like, God damn it. He's surprised. <laughs> But all of a sudden, like, he gets cut in half by Hulkling, who protected his husband by stretching over and transforming his hand into, like, this sharp pincer that just chomped Aqualad in half. You just ruined my cool move! Good. That's my favorite thing to do. Just turn it all around. All right, so I suppose Wonder Girl and Marvel Boy are still sword fighting, but uh, she's going to end that by using her unbreakable lasso to bind his wrists together as they're fighting. And then she's just going to hogtie him, and while he's bound, she's going to decapitate him with her sword. So he's dead. No, no, no. Marvel Boy has, like, cockroach DNA, remember? So, you know, like, cockroaches, they can slip through the smallest of spaces, so he's just going to slip out of her knots. From Dude. her lasso. And then speed. You said that Miss Martian is making him see duplicates of his enemies. Yeah. But you never said anything about his allies. So he sees his allies when they're in trouble. And so he runs up to Marvel Boy and zips him out of harm's way before Wonder Girl can do anything about it. Okay, but speed, he's not going to get very far because Miss Martian, you know, she's still putting her focus on him. So she's just going to telekinetically freeze him in his tracks mm. and then fly over to him and use her intangibility to rip out his heart. Damn, Speed's dead. But Marvel Boy was like right there when it happened, right? So Marvel Boy returns the favor by elongating his nails into claws, and then he's just gonna jam those claws right into Miss Martian's chest and inject her with these nanobots that are gonna scramble her brain and make it like impossible for her to think or keep her form. So she's oh, just man. like this like writhing green mass and Marvel Boy is going to put her out of her misery by transforming his gauntlets into like these plasma flamethrowers and he's just going to fry her to a crisp. Dunzo, she's out. She's out of this match. I did not think she was going to go out that soon, but that was pretty good. I totally forgot about the nanobots, the damn nanobots. Okay, so meanwhile, Superboy... He's going to use his freeze breath on Hulkling to encase him in ice, okay? And mm. then right away, he's going to deliver a super punch that's going to shatter him into a million pieces. Lame. And as that happened, Robin, he's using his expert martial arts skills and bow staff to take on Marvel Boy. Marvel Boy? Robin? Yeah. Yeah. Dude, Marvel Boy would fucking stomp. Marvel Boy is way stronger, faster, like... He just uses energy nunchucks to yank Robin's staff away, and then all it would take is just like a good, solid whack across the dome with the nunchucks, and Robin's out of this match. Okay, but I mean, like, a few seconds later, Marvel Boy's gonna realize, too late, that something's beeping on the back of his neck. A sticky what? vine, right, before his head blows off. So apparently he wasn't smarter. So they took each other out. It looks like it, yeah. All right, pretty good. But uh, Hawkeye, you know, she's still fighting with Arrowette one-on-one, right? Yeah, this is like another Green Arrow versus Hawkeye matchup. They're like really evenly matched. But like Hawkeye knows her own trick arrows better than Arrowette does as they're, I assume, scattered on the ground from when Impulse stole them from Hawkeye's quiver. So um, as they're fighting, Hawkeye is going to pick up a putty arrow and she's going to stab Arrowette with it. And it's going to expand and it's just going to cover Arrowette in this sticky goo. And she's not going to be able to move. So Hawkeye is just going to pick up a rocket arrow then. And she's going to fire it at her, just finishing Arrowette off. What, point blank? You know, she takes a step back or so, you know? She's not stupid. (laughs) And then she's going to use her swordsman sword, walk over to Arrowette's bow, and she's going to sever that line just because. Damn it! (laughs) No, actually, before the bow line gets cut... Wonder Girl is going to wrap her lasso around Hawkeye's neck and Hawkeye's going to get electrocuted to death when Wonder Girl charges it with uh, Zeus's lightning. So boom, Hawkeye's dead. Meanwhile, Superboy with his enhanced vision, you know, he's noticed the ant-sized Wiccan flying around and he's just going to use his heat vision to vaporize that fucker. (laughs) No, Wiccan would just throw up a force field to block the heat vision. Okay. Yeah. But by then, you know, he'd cast a growing spell like... Grow to normal size, grow to normal size, grow to normal size. And once he's back to normal, 
You know, Superboy, just like Superman, has no defense against magic. So Wiccan's probably going to use a reversion spell of what he just did to shrink the telekinetic field that surrounds Superboy. It's going to shrink around him and just crush him to powder, basically. How would he even know he had a telekinetic field around him? Because he's magic. He can reach out and, you know, feel the energy, you know. (laughs) He grows to normal and then he shrinks Superboy, essentially, or his field, rather. Oh, I only have Wonder Girl left. She's my last one standing. Yeah. Okay, uh, well, I guess, you know, as Wiccan is busy crushing Superboy, his head is just going to get lopped off by Wonder Woman. So... That was anticlimactic. <laughs> yeah. That just leaves uh, Wonder Girl and Miss America left. Well, I don't know what Wonder Girl could possibly do to Miss America. What? Like, no matter what she tries, like, if she tries to punch Miss America, she's just going to end up crashing through a star portal that Miss America creates, and Wonder Girl is going to end up in, like, another dimension. Like a freaking dimension that just has country music. Pop country. And Wonder Girl is just going to die from insanity. What the hell is pop country? What is that, like, Taylor Swift? Like, Wonder Girl probably loves (laughs) pop country. (laughs) But, like, regardless, before the portal closes, Wonder Girl, she's just going to hurl her lasso through and yank Miss America in with her, like, right onto her diamond blade. So Wonder Girl may be in a different dimension from where the battle started, but she's the last one alive. No, no, no. I'm saying that Wonder Girl's lasso never latched onto Miss America. I don't know. Even if Miss America got snared by this lasso, she would just create another portal that she goes through to get out of it before Wonder Girl would stab her. And she was able to do it that fast. Yeah, man. She's good. Young Avengers win this one. No way. Young Justice all the way. Well, I guess we could leave it there. I guess scenario one... Wonder Girl stabs Miss America in the country music dimension, or <laughs> she's just trapped there forever and goes insane, or has the time of her life. It sounds like Wonder Girl wins either way. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll go ahead and input the stats on these teams and run the simulations and come back with the big winner. I really like these characters, like on both teams. I knew that this was going to be a pretty fun match, and I think that was. I had a feeling that it was going to be pretty close stat wise. Honestly, overall, there weren't too many differences. The way that we kind of find balance within these team matches is to assign individual pairings to each of the seven members on the teams. So we paired Robin, Tim Drake with Patriot, Superboy with Miss America, Impulse with Speed, of course, Wonder Girl with Marvel Boy, Miss Martian with Hulkling, Arouette with Hawkeye, and Aqualad with Wiccan. Yeah, and some of those characters uh, faced each other directly in dual episodes, like Miss Martian and Hulkling. Right, and that really wasn't a close match at all, but I felt like we were able to compensate for that in other ways, like Wiccan was actually much more powerful than Aqualad. Right, right, right. The biggest disparity that we saw overall was that the Young Justice team overall had much faster characters than Young Avengers. Because Young Justice had Impulse, who's as fast as the speed of light. The other big stat that Young Justice had over Young Avengers was fighting skill. When you look at Robin's stat, comparing to my most trained fighters like Patriot and Hawkeye, they just came up short. And then the final stat that the teams really deferred in was perception, largely because of Miss Martian's telepathic abilities. Yeah, overall, Miss Martian came out to be the most powerful character on both teams. Yeah, individually, she won a whopping 86.8% of all of her matches against everybody. Whereas my most powerful person was, let's see, Wiccan, who won 73.1%. My weakest character was Patriot, who only won 18.9% of his matches. Yeah, and mine was Arouette. She won 32.5% of her matches. And interestingly enough, my prediction was correct. Arouette and Hawkeye were essentially the same character. All of their stats were the same in the same way that Hawkeye and Green Arrow had the same stats. So taking all of this data into consideration, Joseph, who do you think came out on top? Um, I, I don't know. I'm rooting for Young Avengers. I know that despite the fact that there were some gaps in the stats where Young Justice came out on top, Young Avengers had a number of stats in their favor, like uh, evasiveness. Uh, 54% of our Instagram followers said that Young Justice would win over Young Avengers, which is a shame because in the early part of that poll, Young Avengers was on top. And then like Young Justice made a comeback somewhere along the way. That's right. Well, I have the results in front of me right now. The winner 
between the young teams of Young Justice and Young Avengers is Young Justice, bitch. Hey, come on. Win with respect here. <laughs> Win with some dignity. You bitch. <laughs> Young Justice won 54.3% of all of the matches that were simulated. Young Avengers won 457 So those who voted on Instagram were really close to the final result. I mean, it's a fairly close match. It's not too bad. That's not a horrible losing rate. Essentially, Young Justice won just over half of all their matches, which is, you know, enough to get the overall win, but not enough to brag about, really. I don't know. I'm going to try. <laughs> well, I mean, I could brag that it's, you know, still a bigger margin than some of our more recent team duels. Is it? So, uh, braggity brag brag. <laughs> yeah, these team duels usually tend to be pretty close. I know that the most lopsided one was Justice League versus Avengers. Oh, yeah. Oh, I, everyone saw that coming. I didn't see that coming. I didn't see this coming. But you know what? Marvel probably owed you one, uh, considering all the team duels that Marvel has walked away victorious from. Ooh, has Marvel won more team duels than DC? I'm pretty sure it's about half. Someone let us know. <laughs> At the end of the day, I guess uh, we just continue to prove that justice triumphs over vengeance. I don't know what that means. A- avenging. <laughs> All right. Yeah. It's late. That does it for this duel, guys. Let us know what you thought about the results by writing to us at dynamicduelpodcast at gmail.com or by visiting us on Instagram or Twitter. You can find links to all of our accounts by checking out our show notes or visiting our website, dynamicduel.com. And on our site, you could also find a link to our Patreon page where we offer ad-free episodes of the show, bonus content, including top 10 episodes and bloopers, access to our Discord chat server, and as we mentioned earlier, the exclusive opportunity to get our Infinity Crisis Marvel vs. DC deck building card game. Again, check it out right after this episode at patreon.com slash dynamic duel, which is linked in our show notes. Our lowest tier is only $2 a month. But that is it for this episode. Next week, we are going to review the latest Disney Plus television special, actually their first special for Marvel, which is Werewolf by Night. It looks really good from the trailers. I've heard that it's really good. We're going to find out next week. The special comes out on October 7th. So look forward to watching that. It's a great way to kick off the Halloween season. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely looking forward to it. I actually can't wait to see it this week. Thank you guys so much for joining us for our 300th episode. We want to give a big thanks to our executive producers, Ken Johnson, John Starosky, Zachary Hepburn, Dustin Balcom, Miggy Matangian, Brandon Estergaard, Nathaniel Wagner, Levi Yaton, Austin Wisolowski, Nick Abonto, and AJ Dunkerley for helping make this podcast possible. And we'll talk to you guys next week. Up, up, and away. True believers.